In a glorious find from the nostalgia file, in 2013, an Italian court sentenced a homeless man to house arrest, following a series of arrests for crimes ranging from attempted robbery to drug dealing. In spite of his not having an established residence, the man was ordered to stay on a particular section of sidewalk instead. Oh no! Well... <laughs> He was Italian, so I suppose it's better than sleeping with the fishes. <laughs> oh. Well, if you wanted honesty, you have come to the wrong place. This is the Disinformed Podcast. I'm Shane. I'm Michael. I'm Courtney. Yes, we are a John Free Zone right now, so sex workers everywhere, rejoice. <laughs> I, I had to leave at least a little bit of a gap, just... um. In, in, memorandum. in memory of John? Yes, yes. In memorandum? Yeah, in memorandum. Oh, all right. Well, you may prove me wrong on being funny tonight, Michael. I'm, I'm hoping. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, uh... I aim to disappoint. John has been sent as a correspondence to a, a sausage convention in Chicago. And uh, congratulations and good luck with that hall pass there, friend. We uh, will miss you. But uh, we hope your experimentation is fruitful. That reminds me, last night we actually had, for the first time in a long time, a prank caller asking for a driver with a big sausage pizza. And uh, <laughs> I only knew that because the general manager that was on the uh, taking the order started going, <laughs> Oh, you funny! <laughs> for a solid, like, couple of minutes um, before he hung up on the guy. <laughs> I, was I like, thought we uh, weren't <laughs> talking about adult material tonight, Michael. I mean, the guy just wanted a driver with a big sausage pizza. He, he he didn't say anything about the driver specifically. He just wanted a large extra sausage pizza. But you know, you've been on this show. We had an episode that was entitled Big Sausage Pizza because you couldn't <laughs> carry last Thursdayism for more than 20 minutes. So uh, it's your fault. I did not bring up pornography. It's yeah. on you. <laughs> yeah. That's, so, that's on me. Uh, I'm the as I today. mentioned, I, I discovered I had a problem mm. because uh, we were going to do a, a pincer movement for our shopping yesterday in that uh, Melissa, we were down to our last coffee creamer, which means we are at DEFCON 4 and uh, action needs to be taken. <laughs> so um, we have very particular needs with her not being able to have anything that is milk based. So... Um, She's big on almond creamer, so we have to kind of hope that there is a sufficient quantity for us to lay siege to. So uh, I go to Albertsons to get the creamer I will use. And uh, that's also, you know, touch and go because the Lucerne Italian sweet cream is apparently crack to half of the coffee drinkers this side of Glendale because... I can hardly ever find it, so there's like four of us that are just constantly jockeying for a position <laughs> who just raid all 12 bottles out of the Albertsons or the Safeway and then just run. Uh, I'm fairly certain I have stock in Lucerne right now based on the volume that I purchased. Oh, no. <laughs> and then Melissa will go to Sprouts and, and grab things. So the Sprouts that is near us is closing. Oh. No! So, uh huh. So I'm already heartbroken. But so then I go to just, you know, the only things I'm looking for is she wants turkey pastrami, if they have it, because she can't have beef any longer. And I'm going to get coffee creamer. So I go in, they don't have turkey pastrami. Go figure. This is just the, the luck of the draw these days. So I'm grabbing random things as I see them. And, you know, she really likes bay uh, as the, you know, the fruit water, uh, if you will. And uh, it's got antioxidants. So, you know, you got to do that. And I grab a thing of uh, cran pomegranate because I'm, I'm a drinking fiend. And, of course, the, the Dr. Pepper Zero, as I alluded to pre-roll. So I get up to the counter and I start unloading my stuff. And I realize... I have nothing in my bag that is not a liquid. It is all <laughs> beverages. And I was like, I, I am the non-alcoholic alcoholic walking in here <laughs> with enough beverages to have a small party in my own honor. And I was like, I look like a weirdo. There's just, there's no way to explain this. I have 16 items on the thing and it's all beverages. Oh my God. Yeah, so it's a problem. How much coffee do you drink a day? I feel like... I have not seen you ever once, ever, not talking about coffee at least mm -hmm. once. Like, how much do you drink? If if I have a mind to, 
and all too often I do. Uh, I have a 32-ounce sort of tumbler that I use in the morning. That is my get me through the bulk of the day, and then I will often have another one when I get home. Uh, Because the caffeine does nothing to me at all, so it's just a (laughs) beverage I enjoy drinking. So this is what's funny is I had one attack of tachycardia at one point. And I think it was, it was stress related, uh, just there's a lot of stuff going on. (laughs) And so I went to the doctor to discuss it because both of my parents have arrhythmia or dysrhythmia. And so it's a problem. So I'm kind of, I'm really tempting fate here with the way I'm treating my body, (laughs) but drive it like you stole it. Right. So I, the doctor's asking me, she's like, well, what do you, I know you don't drink and I know you don't do any, you know, drugs or anything. What might have caused this? I said, well, I had a caramel macchiato. Um, at around two o'clock and that's really like the main coffee I had for today, which is a surprise. She's like, Oh, okay. Well, how much coffee do you usually drink? And I went, okay. Those are three. <laughs> it's like maybe 64 ounces. <laughs> 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 at which point her jaw officially hit the floor and she's like, well, that's your problem. I was like, oh, no, I don't feel the caffeine at all. It's not. And she's like, but that's a lot of coffee, Shane. And I was like, well, mostly, you know, it's uh, I, I will get lattes frequently. So, I mean, that's mostly milk. She's like, but that's espresso. <laughs> so we're sitting here arguing semantics about the fact that I'm trying to induce a heart attack by age 40. And yeah, she just wasn't wasn't hearing it. <laughs> you're not feeling it, but your little hummingbird of a heart is just like, please don't actually. <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, you know, my little Grinch heart is just struggling along to, to keep this hate-filled body functioning moment to moment. Uh, so we have uh, we have a controversy we have to discuss this evening, friends. Yeah. To bring John uh, back or not? <laughs> Ooh. That, I, I already cast my vote. Uh, everybody knows. <laughs> Uh, what's their what's their controversy i've i've been the uh you know at the the folly of that little chuckle fuck for seven years now so i mean if we (laughs) we can purge that out of my system i'll be much better uh michael at our show last saturday uh addressed a very concerning uh problem here with me and i feel like it it needs to be addressed because it, it involves somebody namely probably me curtailing behavior yet again so michael give me the give me the scoop so i went to see their show in anthem which is in northern phoenix uh it's a decent of a uh, decent amount of a drive especially from my own location which is very south of phoenix um, if you comment we'll give you the address exactly uh, yeah tune in uh and uh you'll know exactly where i am you can even map it out yourself um but so i invited my girlfriend Destiny's sister and her boyfriend, who also has started to uh, re-listen to the show. He li- he started listening to it a while ago and then I think dropped it for a time. I don't know why. But he All started right. listening to it again. <laughs> and so we sent out the invite to, hey, you know, they're going to be playing an anthem. And so Destiny's sister uh, says, you know, I'm coming because, you know, I have nothing else better to do. Um, but my boyfriend <laughs> won't. Uh, in fact, he might actually not be seeing their shows ever again. And we're like, okay, that's a, a weird thing to say. Mm-hmm. How come? And she's like, well, the way that they treat you on the podcast <laughs> is it, it's 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 unnecessary. Um, yeah, to the point where he doesn't want to support their endeavors, their band endeavors, because of the way I am treated on this podcast. Mm-hmm. So um, I figured I wanted to at least express uh, that discontent to both shane and john which I okay think. yes well uh on on behalf of the podcast proper and i know that i speak for john when i say this uh good fucking riddance and uh, <laughs> don't let the door hit you on the ass on the way out Oof, because <laughs> that ain't fucking changing I looked at her during your guys' performance, and I said, you know, is was that a real reason, or did he just not want to get out of bed, which I understand completely. Mm. <laughs> and I don't 
think she had a real answer to that. <laughs> okay. Well, reprobates usually do have struggles with gravity, I find, and so I'm not entirely shocked, but uh, it's okay. I usually prefer to have fans that can put together cogent sentences and can speak in uh, syllables longer than two or three, so uh, we but, won't miss you, friend. And, but I'm uh, your fan, though, and uh, I definitely can't do that most times I go to your shows. Well, I need you for things, Michael, so I'm willing to put up with your bullshit. Uh, what fair. did you say to that, Michael? Like, that, that is a bold thing to say to someone who is literally sitting there at their show. I Well, I mean, I didn't say it immediately like, hey, people don't want to attend because you're mean to me on the no. podcast. What did you? How did you respond to that situation? Oh, I laughed. I thought it was funny. <laughs> <laughs> and then I immediately wasn't sure if he was being serious or not. Uh, which is why I asked her if that was the case. Because <laughs> I, I laughed pretty heavily because I was like, you, you know, they're they're my friends. Like, you know, friends, you know, rib, rib each other. You know, they give each mm -hmm, other shit and mm -hmm. all that other stuff. If I thought that they were actually serious and they genuinely did not like me, the podcast wouldn't exist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so... I'm, not, I'm not a masochist. I don't, I don't hate myself that much where I need to, like, record a couple hours a week of people just bagging on me for no reason <laughs> but if that's something you're into and you'd like to pay us email us <laughs> oh yeah yes of course i mean i'll sell out if I, i'm if i'm getting paid to get you know bagged on for several hours a week shit yeah i'll, I'll find the i'll find the people that hate me the most do it. Our Patreon tiers are going to be really entertaining <laughs> to look at, I'm afraid. If you give $10 a month, you can actually send a personal, thought-out, hate-filled message to Michael, and it will be read on air. <laughs> I, I was thinking more of like you know the the scale of pseudo-masochistic activity so like you know <laughs> tier one is like a gimp suit if you pay fifty dollars a month <laughs> like you can just have michael as your personal slave and he'll do anything he'll lick your shoes he'll let you pee on his hands like you know just what whatever whatever gets you there uh and i won't even get off on it which is probably the saddest thing yeah, i'm not shocked <sighs> Uh, well, uh, yes, in case we really do have to clarify this anywhere, because I think uh, in our attempts to get back to kinder and gentler uh, activity here, yeah, we, we all love each other. For those of you who haven't been paying attention, we do spend uh, a significant amount of time around one another, and it's it's kind of what it, uh, you know old school ridiculous machismo that you play a game of the dozens with one another from time or i'm sorry machismo for for john and the other <laughs> folks without any good sense uh yeah so we're, we're all just we're, we're taking the piss out of each other that's uh that's what you do when you're a big fan of the uk or just hatred in general <laughs> I wake up looking like this. I can't be happy. <laughs> Just wake up with a frown, and I got to find something to be pissed at. No, in point of fact, uh, I start the day with a smile, just oh. so I can get it over with, and uh, <laughs> then I, I move on. It's always good. Well, uh, I have a lot of excitement uh, in store for us here this evening, friends, but uh, as I told Michael beforehand, this is your shot. You are you are down one of the the primary egotists on this show who uh, just loves to tell you all about their their life and their comings and goings. So I I can lay back and and let you all just just tell me what's on your mind. Uh, oh, so how is everyone today? I, I feel like I should get that out of the way. <laughs> uh, yep, yep, that's what we want. I I just really love the idea that that's the format of this is just you know like well, bullshit and then somebody will say some stuff and that's it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Isn't that how most podcasts are? <laughs> it's kind no, of the but, format for the medium. But when yeah. you when you start with the how is everybody doing today? Oh. Like that's just not. No, where do you go yeah. with that? Like there's no. Way to build off that into anything good. Oh, no. I mean, that's how most AA meetings start. <laughs> <laughs> which I think is what John's trying to either replicate or avoid, which is oh. why he always brings up at the beginning, you know, 
He's I short wonder. of like, he's trying to get his chip for the week. I think we can just tell <laughs> Becky like, yeah, I saw my therapist. Actually, that makes a lot of sense that that could be why. He's just avoidance therapy through mm-hmm. the podcast. We are the official avoidance therapy podcast. <laughs> no, I started therapy. You guys pushed me all the way into that. I was close. Oh. And then I started doing this and I was like, all right, therapy it I is. the real thing. <laughs> Yeah, I had a, a couple of very lengthy exchanges on uh, Slack with a couple co-workers uh, yesterday who asked me how I was. And then I was like, OK, well, uh, you're going to borderline on a, on a therapy session if you really want to hear the answer to that. But uh, here's just this scraping the scab off. And after seven paragraphs, I was like, that's kind of where my headspace is at. But that's like one thirty second of where I'm actually living right now. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, always an entertaining time, but, uh, that's neither here nor there. And I'm not going to get into the, <laughs> you know, reason number 8,972,604, why I want to kill my bandmates this week. Oh, no. We're just going oh, to no. let that roll. Well, I mean, you can say whatever you want because neither John nor Sam will ever hear this. Yeah, it's a fine True. point. But Logan is a is a little rat bitch, and he'll tell them. No, he's also the best true. one. <laughs> I kid, I kid. I love Logan to death. He'll just never be on this show, so I I know that. <laughs> <laughs> we gave him a shot. Uh, he was invited, and and we tried to finagle him on, and he suddenly, uh, you know, uh, accumulated a couch <laughs> that he desperately needed to go collect and and clean up with his roommate. I did see pictures of said couch. Very nice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Was it I mean, was it worth ditching the uh, the episode? Do you prefer comfort or being talked at for an hour and a half? Well, considering that we're recording this, um, <laughs> hour and a half sounds good. Oh, okay. Well, you know, <laughs> give me a breakdown, an emotional breakdown of why the couch has equal or greater value than this recording. Oh, I'm on the verge of an emotional breakdown. You don't have to ask for it. Uh, Courtney, I will say I heard a lot of really wonderful feedback regarding the uh, the MSG episode. Don't roll your eyes at me for fuck's sake. Just take the compliment. I don't I don't think any of us know how to take compliments. No. I can take one. My ego's oh. big enough that I know how to harbor it. I just pretend that I don't like it so that you'll keep doing it. Uh, uh, that's oh, that's yeah, that's me too. Yep, mhm. Mm-hmm. Totally. No, oh, I'm thank great. you. I appreciate that. I yeah, no, I don't take compliments well, and I thought I did awful last week <laughs> again. So <laughs> no, I think the what I actually wound up talking about this with, of course, our uh, our number one critic and uh, our super fan Stephen, uh, because he had mentioned he's like it was a really interesting episode. Like I found out a lot of things, and he's like I have thought that I got a headache when I would eat things that had uh, MSG in it, and now I know that's probably not the case, but who knows. But in the course of our discussing, I said, yeah, I think we really have a really interesting – how many times can I say really in a sentence? (laughs) A lot. We have a dynamic that's established with a podcast, or at least I will speak for myself in saying that there is a difference between when I am listening or hearing with intention – and oftentimes I'm waiting for places that I can insert a joke or, you know, do something to try to keep it light in an investment. Because otherwise, I have what happened last week, which is I get engrossed in the topic and I'm not listening for lies and I'm not really <laughs> caring. I'm just going, this is really interesting. So if I'm just listening to assimilate the info and digest it, then I kind of defeat the point of the podcast. <laughs> and so it's a real weird dichotomy because I, I have to be engaged and I do want to listen. But at the same time, it's like I have to be thinking about where I can put an appropriately placed dick joke, as we know. <laughs> So, but I was very engrossed last week because I have heard a lot of uh, discussion about MSG, and I was obviously intrigued. So it was it was an excellent episode. I liked it a lot. Thank you. I would I I listened to another food science thing again today. I'm just like I just want to talk about food science all the time. And then now I'm here, and I'm like, oh, I can make other people listen to me talk about food science. <laughs> so I really had a good time with that. Um, Michael has me thinking about doing a corn syrup. Uh, Ooh, episode okay. now because that was a really interesting kind of subtopic that we got off on mm-hmm. so yeah i'm i'm really glad that it was well received because i was very nervous 
<laughs> well, uh, we are always our own worst critic, and uh, here's the exact exchange. So let me blow your ego up just a little bit so, more, geez. but I think it's 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 uh, relevant to the discourse here. Stephen said, "Yeah, Courtney, like really, usually just like knocks it out of the park, and uh, you know she she's she does a great job." And I'm sitting here just kind of digesting this and going, "Okay, so it's it's one." Yes, we all have to kind of get past our own ego, hopefully. And uh, I went, you know, by comparison, she is still kind of in the nascent stages of her hosting this show. And I think it's probably like your, what, ninth or tenth topic overall? If that, like yeah. That. Yeah. And one of the reasons I keep that odd little spreadsheet that I do of all of our material is that it's useful data. And I know uh, Michael enjoys <laughs> tasty tasty <laughs> data tasty, little tasty morsels data. um but michael and i are both cresting around 40 episodes presented mm -hmm. uh in numerically and i was like yeah we've reached that point where we've kind of established what our lanes are and when we veer too wildly outside of them we start getting into stuff that we probably shouldn't be talking about <laughs> like so. weed <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't uh, going to say it. I was going to leave that up to you. When an episode comes out a week before and then the next one comes out and passes views within two days, uh, I'm like, okay, uh, yeah, no, you, uh, your MSG episode has more downloads than my uh, Dank Kush episode from the week prior. People just already no. know about Dank Kush. <sighs> they yeah, just know. Um, yeah, I might so. say I may have <laughs> torpedoed that episode slightly by calling you Whitey, Whitey Mike, Mike in yeah. the uh, in the descriptor. <laughs> I did notice that too, and I had that thought as well. But I'm like, ah, I'm going to attribute it to my own incompetence and anything else. <laughs> it's easier that way. <laughs> well, I mean, we can always change the title and see if that has any sort of impact in the download rate, and and see whether or not that oh, actually that would be did. So funny. Just change the episode to like XXX Weed 420 Blaze It. Uh, uh -huh. see it skyrockets hundreds of downloads something stupid like that i i <laughs> thought we were just going to call it like diamond hands crushing or something uh, but uh, we all do have our lanes that has been you know pretty firmly established and on that particular point here uh, I can segue into what we are going to be discussing this week, friends and neighbors, because I have got a wang doodle of a topic here. Uh, so for those of you who are uninitiated, what we usually do on this show is we will dive into a random esoteric topic in the course of Michael chugging a gallon of lemonade <laughs> from the jug. That's what I'm thinking, will... too. Kane's lemonade. It's good stuff. It's It's like crack to me. I don't know why. Starting to have a real Soylent Green kind of feeling here about <laughs> what's going into your bodies. but Lemonade uh, is people. <laughs> I mean, it is technically, depending upon what website you're on. Uh, <laughs> anywho, we usually will discuss a random esoteric topic, and in the course of explaining it, we lie about it occasionally, because that is the shtick, it's the format of the show, and it's incumbent on the co-hosts to ferret out the uh, fact from fiction, and call those lies out when they hear them. So, for this week, I will tell you up front, Miss Courtney, that we have eight, count oh them, my God. eight lovely lies that are just awaiting you. Oh my goodness. I in can't the glorious high. discussion <laughs> of the Stardust Ranch. Now, you may not have heard of the Stardust Ranch, so allow me to give you a bit of preamble. But before I do that, I have some bona fide, actual, required trigger warnings here, friend. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm trying to be more considerate with these as well, just in particular, because I realize we occasionally throw out topics on this thing. And, uh, for instance, like uh, incest uh, that uh, do need to, to be discussed when we have our... Stephen asked me earlier, Michael, since your eyes are rolling. Oh, uh, oh I, they weren't rolling. I was just debating. I, I was thinking, was that an actual thing that people do appreciate trigger warnings on? And I'm and sure because yeah, once we started talking about Uncle Touchy, I think we uh, we certainly alienated a couple people. Fair. Certainly, that's totally fair. Uh -huh. <laughs> Particularly when that became our first recurring character on the show. <laughs> oh. I'm blaming Pat Oswald on that, and then John's uh, ability to parrot things. But uh, <laughs> anywho. <laughs> Here, for the concerned parties and folks that want to gird their loins, uh, these are the trigger warnings. 
at least the ones that need to be listed up front, animal abuse, death, sexual violence, abduction, and helplessness. All of these things <laughs> will be uh, contained within the topic, and so it's something that needs to be clarified up front. But is everyone ready? Oh, yeah. Yes, now I am. I'm terrified. I'm Let's glad. go. You, uh, I, I assure you it's not going to be as dour as it sounds up front. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to make sure I can keep those in there just for safekeeping. So if we have discovered anything over the course of nearly 100 shows of this sick little podcast, it's that I am a dedicated documentarian of paranormal incidents, uh, much to everyone's chagrin, I'm sure. But uh, be it encounters with spectral entities, extra-dimensional beings, disaffected dolls, or even Michael's diction, ah. I simply must submit tales of the extraordinary for your consumption. And thus, when the extraterrestrial affairs are afoot in this inglorious state that we reside in, you know that I cannot resist the opportunity to unveil them. And so, it is my great pleasure to introduce you all to Arizona's answer to the Skinwalker Ranch... Stardust Ranch. <sighs> so, with U.S. <laughs> intelligence agencies expected to deliver a report on unidentified aerial phenomena, the, uh, the UAP, which is what they've converted to now instead of UFO, mm -hmm. uh, to Congress this month, we're sparking renewed interest and speculation into how the government has handled sightings of mysterious flying objects, and subsequently, this topic feels exceptionally timely. So I figured we would just treat you all to some of the things happening in our backyard. Quite literally, as a matter of stern fact. <laughs> uh, and also off the top for fans of the American Dream, doth there rode the son of a plumber and his progeny, I can offer my strictest assurances that uh, he has nothing to do with the cavalcade of alien incidents occurring in Buckeye, Arizona, or more specifically, a region apparently known as Rainbow Valley. So we're also giving a nod to Pride Month as well while we're here, Ooh. which is very important. <laughs> Yay! I like yes. It. It's, uh... So... Let's just dive right in here. Uh, so while many ufologists may be familiar with the atrocities and abnormalities encountered on the Skinwalker Ranch in Utah, the incredible tales of alien encounters, demon possessions, cattle mutilations, unidentified aerial phenomena, and slayings with samurai swords that we are to find at Stardust Ranch are a bit more obscure to the discerning devotee of alien lore. You heard me correctly, kids. <laughs> <laughs> this is just like my Japanese animes. Uh, get ready. So the story of Stardust Ranch is not bound with tentacles yet, Michael. So it's not Aww. entirely like your anime. I We're getting there. My mind. <laughs> senpai, no. <laughs> no, senpai. <laughs> uh, first and foremost, this story is a bizarre amalgam of an array of horror, sci-fi, and action-adventure tropes. So, you can assume all you will about that. While Arizona is often depicted as a vortex for supernatural activity, from the Phoenix Lights to the Travis Walton abduction, which we covered in the archives earlier, this tale is truly transcendent in its peculiarities. Only if Quentin Tarantino himself directed a reboot of Close Encounters of the Third Kind starring David Crosby and Delta Burke would you observe anything remotely close to the absurdity and hyperbolic bunch of nonsense that I am about to unveil here. I'm not kidding. Ooh. However, psychiatric therapist John Edmonds and his wife, Joyce, herself purportedly a former FBI employee, claim the phenomena they have encountered at their home is genuine, ghastly, and outright terrifying. By 1996, the Ed and I know what you're going to say. <laughs> No, we're not talking about uh, the time that mankind was tossed off the top of Hell in the Cell by the Undertaker, plummeting 20 feet down to the floor. That was okay. in 96? Huh. I quit. Oh. <laughs> I would have been a year old. Remember that oh. very well. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we all have our little occasional acid trips, I'm sure. But uh, so... By 96, the Edmonds had saved enough capital to buy the idyllic Arizona property where they hoped to rescue and raise horses, 
dogs, and other wildlife. They found isolated ranch land in Buckeye, Arizona. The height of class and sophistication, I can assure you. (laughs) Uh, And purchased what they believed to be their dream home. However, incidents on the property would soon turn their blossoming dream into a moldering nightmare. From the onset, life on Stardust Ranch was fraught with ominous omens. On the day the couple moved into the home, they discovered the previous owners had left all of their belongings. Oh, no. Odd. And because this gentleman hails from Chicago, where John is presently enjoying a good sausage, I'm finally going to get to put a character on here. So, it was as though they had vanished in a night, Edmonds says. He's gone on to indicate in later interviews that the previous owners had, in fact, simply disappeared and that no one has any information regarding their whereabouts. It is, is unclear. Is that bullshit that they just disappeared? Not bullshit, at least according to him. Oh, uh, okay. It is unclear, this was the sentence that was directly following that, it's unclear whether this has been corroborated in any way by independent sources. This is just Edmonds claiming this. Okay. Of course, Edmonds, arriving to begin moving his own belongings into the home, contacted their real estate agent to report the found furniture and other belongings. He was advised that everything would be promptly removed in a few hours. So John next returned home later that day to discover an unattended bonfire blazing on the edge of the property line, which he presumes contained all of the abandoned assets. He stayed to monitor the inferno and prevent it from spreading to the surrounding scrub brush, as you Uh, need to in Arizona. Oh my god. Time to be more topical about Arizona stuff. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. Thankfully, the area was rather sparsely cultivated at the time, and for the record, the current population of Rainbow Valley is roughly 34 residents per square mile. So you can imagine what it was like in 96. Oh my god. It was just those two. (laughs) Uh So thankfully, neither his home nor any neighboring buildings were threatened by the fire. After the leftover materials had burnt down to cinders, John returned to the ranch house, intending to chastise the realtor for the dangerous and inconsiderate solution to the clearing of the remnant accoutrement, only to find a wild-eyed and raving man sauntering up his driveway. The individual was bizarrely (laughs) attired as he was shirtless, clad only in tattered khaki shorts, flip-flops, and mirrored sunglasses, boasting an unruly (laughs) thatch of hair and a caterpillar mustache. (laughs) So just Michael on, like, a Tuesday morning. (laughs) That was the image I was going for. (laughs) Is the caterpillar uh, mustache bullshit. (laughs) The caterpillar mustache bullshit. Um, Yes, his description is is bullshit. (laughs) Ha ha! They basically just say it was a a wild guy who was walking up the driveway. (laughs) Uh, so all of that is bullshit. But, uh, (laughs) much to John's dismay, the man was also carrying a fucking machete. (laughs) (laughs) Sounds like backwoods Arizona. (laughs) Uh, Edmonds, himself unarmed, which I agree is rather bizarre for an Arizona resident. I know. (laughs) Apprehensively approached the man to inquire just what in the Sam Hill he was doing there. (laughs) The stranger coldly remarked, There are monsters on this property, and I'm the one who kills them. No! No! I would be like, get the realtor back in the line, we and burn this down. Next. Can we start another bonfire? It's like, where's that blowtorch? Can I, uh, can I Tarantino this thing, please? <laughs> So incredibly jarred, as you would expect, being in the middle of nowhere and approached by a random machete-wielding madman, Edmonds instructed the man to leave and never return, to which the stranger replied, You're gonna wish that I was here. (laughs) No, he did not say that. He did say that. Oh, (laughs) no. At least according to John Edmonds, which, uh, granted, you're going to get far more uh, concerned uh, or be a little more dubious about his claims as we go on. Oh, Oh, no. (laughs) From that moment on, life on the farm was anything but idyllic and carefree for the couple. Within the first few weeks of residing in the home, both John and Joyce began seeing strange orbs of light scattering around the compound. Believing these... Quite justly, 
to be flashlights carried by a machete-wielding madman, the couple <laughs> would go to investigate and discover that the orbs would shoot skyward at alarming rates whenever they drew near. Unsettled and thoroughly confused, the couple routinely telephoned local authorities to report these sightings, like you do, <laughs> hoping to corroborate their experiences and possibly collate their observations with other reports from the surrounding area. The police would respond to the property, consistently concluding that they could observe nothing amiss and that no reports from adjacent property owners had been received. From there, developments dramatically escalated. You should have invited Machete Guy back. Like, what are we doing? We gotta Uh, find this guy. (laughs) He's going to uh, be a necessary evil at some point, I think, but... uh, (laughs) Several of the fostered horses kept on the ranch under John's nonprofit business, which is very cutefully entitled Hopeful Hooves. Oh, no, yeah. is that bullshit? Not bullshit. That is actually <laughs> okay, the good. business I like title. that. That's a good name. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so let me go to an entirely different end of the spectrum. The horses were found dead with mutilations, including <laughs> oh, no. the consistent removal of both of their eyes and the tongues of all of the animals. Oh, hell no. Uh-huh. Hmm. Okay. Some horses had apparently knocked down metal fencing on the property through attempts to escape their enclosures. Edmund's regular Joe personality and down-to-earth way of describing his otherworldly dilemma, that of a laid-back former musician, concert promoter, and social worker who's simply trying to run a ranch, starts to devolve when these topics are broached. I mean, this is insane. He stammers when asked to detail his findings. The agents from the Department of Agriculture we phoned in claimed that deaths and mutilations were not consistent with animal or scavenger attacks. They were actually opened an investigation into me and my wife because they claimed we were abusing the animals. It's completely insane. While the investigations were ongoing, their worries grew exponentially. Both John and Joyce indicate they began experiencing alien encounters late at night after sightings of orbs on the property. Each details physically interacting with what they describe as gray aliens, roughly three feet tall, with bulbous heads, bulging eyes, and long, gaunt limbs. Now, I know it sounds like the co-host of this podcast who is not present right now, but just (laughs) hear me out. No. It's not a one of them that has a uh, a mustache or a caterpillar mustache, so we can well, we this, can be safe. This was in '96 or something like that, and so John was like, what, five or six? Uh huh. Yeah, he would have been three feet tall at the time. Yeah. <laughs> it makes sense. That's is my that, new head cannon. <laughs> is that really how they described or depicted the aliens? Yep. Oh no. Okay. <laughs> yep. <laughs> So just baby cool. John just running around without a diaper, <laughs> just antagonizing the poor folks on this farm. Ripping out eyes and tongues. I want porn. <laughs> oh, no. If I can't fuck a woman, I'm going to fuck this horse. Oh, God. <laughs> it's a different meaning to the phrase going bareback from uh, John, I think. <laughs> Sorry, Mom. Sorry, God. (laughs) All right. They also began routinely encountering what Edmonds labeled as the Brillo Men. (laughs) The Brillo? Like the pads? Yep. Why did I drink lemonade at that point? I don't know. Also why I said it. I was waiting to watch you gag, so... Uh, The Brillo Men. The Brillo Men. (laughs) Shadowy, amorphous shapes with no distinguishing features that aimlessly clean their dishes at night. (laughs) I was going to say, why is it Brillo? (laughs) Yeah, no, they uh, they, uh, apparently aimlessly wander the property and then disappear into thin air. Why that means they're Brillo Men, I have no earthly idea, but neither does he. So it's it's perfectly fine. (laughs) Over the years, John then claims these various visitations increased in frequency and severity, moving from simple sightings to assaults, experiments, and possible abductions. So both John and Joyce claim to suffer major bodily trauma and significant scarring due to their entanglements with the alien entities at the ranch. Edmonds commented during a Darkness Radio interview that it got me so bad with my wife that, uh, you know, with things coming after her, that uh, she used to beg me 
to handcuff her to the bed because she was so frightened she was going to be taken. No. Sure enough. Ugh. Really, oh. really said that. <laughs> My the uh, team from the Travel Channel's Ghost Adventures stopped by Stardust Ranch to document the activity themselves. They seemed convinced of the property's paranormal activities. Several team members saw strange figures and lights, and one woman ended up with bruises on her arm, having spent time alone in the Edmonds' bedroom. If the lights were off, I'm still assuming it's John, but... Uh... <laughs> Time to handcuff you. In speaking with Zach Bagans, the host for the episode, Joyce even claimed to have rebuked the aliens in the name of Christ to ward them away from her, going no. so far as to <laughs> actually claimed that this worked. <laughs> no, really? Yes. Oh my. <laughs> Bagans <laughs> then uses this assertion to uh, offer the notion that perhaps they're encountering demonic or supernatural attacks, either in concert with or masquerading as encounters with extra dimensional entities. Oh, no. <laughs> These aren't aliens, actually. These are actually demons pretending to be aliens. Uh huh. Because, he, you know, I, that makes a difference. I shit you not. He says that with a straight face. We think, well, you know. <laughs> Demons, uh, they, they, they like to impersonate things. That's like, what, they're Pee Wee fucking Herman now? <laughs> <laughs> Tweak your nipples in your sleep like, ha ha! <laughs> Playing tequila, dancing around with their little three feet bodies on top of your wet bar, just like, nah, 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 nah. <sighs> We've got paranormal activity. What are they doing? They're serving margaritas! <laughs> Uh, without salt on the rim. Uh, well, they can't do salt. You know, it's been cursed. <laughs> I formed a circle of it around myself. So there's no more left for the drinks. I can't drink my margarita. There's a ring of salt around it. <laughs> they think I'm the margarita. People are just licking my nipples now. Uh, oh. Ooh. Hey. Sounds like a different type of... Uh... Alien there. I, I like where this is going. Oh, it's a no. salty senorita. Is that what you're driving at? Yeah, I'm a salty Michael's going to animate this now, and I'm going to be upset again. Uh. We're all living with that trauma, I assure you. But uh, <laughs> All right, get ready, because this I mean this sentence as I say it. Oh, no. This, friends, is where the trolley car will officially take leave of the rails. <laughs> Most of the manifestations of violence seem to center on Joyce, who is constantly plagued with visitations during which she's unable to move or scream. The couple claims to have awoken to puncture wounds on their skin, weeping trails of blood, as though syringes were used on them in the night. These marks are often accompanied by bruising on their inner thighs, abdomen, and chest. Each also claims to frequently experience instances of lost time, leading them to conclude that they are being routinely abducted. The situation escalated to a fever pitch once John and Joyce were finally awakened by the sound of their three rescue Rottweilers barking at and subsequently attacking an alien creature in their home. The creature retreated from the onslaught, and the dogs were called back unharmed. However, mere days removed from the encounter, all three dogs simply dropped dead. Well, mm -hmm. okay, poor pups. Uh, yes, that is, uh, this is where I started having the, the, the woogie feelings, because I'm like, oh man, like, <sighs> please don't kill puppies, let's, let's not do that. But uh, John goes on to further assert that he personally began to do battle with these creatures in an attempt to protect the sanctity of his home and the physical well-being of his wife. He began cultivating an arsenal of handguns, shotguns, edged weapons, and even assault rifles to help ward off further alien incursions. He is in Arizona, so yeah, I, I say, this, this is completely plausible. <laughs> <laughs> This is the Arizona mentality, I believe. <laughs> uh, wasting away in Marijuanaville, I think. But here we are. <sighs> Joyce had said to me on many occasions that she would rather be killed than abducted. He indicated during the Ghost Adventures taping. Uh, <laughs> um, <sighs> that sounds problematic in some ways. Mm-hmm. I just I have a lot they'd... of 
thoughts on what's actually happening, and it's just very upsetting across the we'll board. We'll get there. <laughs> oh, <Yep>. no. <laughs> uh, yeah, let's hope that they don't have a life insurance policy on Joyce. But um, anywho. Oh, no. Following the loss of their dear dogs, Joyce began to be, as John states it, levitated out of their bedroom window by unseen forces, winging her down the halls of their home and out of the back door towards an awaiting ship in the yard. <laughs> to prevent her being taken, John resorted to what some may call drastic measures. As he states it, there was a corner light that came down from the ship, and she began to raise into the corner light. So I grabbed an AK-47 with a double banana clip in it, and I went outside and opened up. <laughs> God. This was, apparently, and I'm sorry for your editing purposes, Michael, here, a sufficient deterrent to prevent a fucking interstellar vessel pressurized <laughs> to withstand <laughs> space travel. <laughs> <laughs> He should have brought the armor-piercing bullets. Sorry, I'm going to calm down go. and do that one more time. This is going to prevent a interstellar vessel pressurized to withstand space travel from departing with his wife's lifeless form. Apparently it worked. Oh, good. I'm, I'm so happy for them. But apparently it was only a slight stalemate because John goes on to further indicate that Joyce has been molested, more or less, by their intruders, with Joyce herself claiming that many nights she's woken up with her inner thighs rubbed so raw that they were bleeding. Uh. On one such night, that's why I have trigger warnings, dear lady, I'm sorry, but yeah, as I started <laughs> no. getting into this, I was like, I have to say something. I'm uh. not just gonna, you know, throw this out there and hope that everybody takes it in good humor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> So, on one such evening, John indicates he walked into their bedroom to discover that Joyce was being levitated above their bed by a trio of tiny greys. Which, again, <laughs> this is giving all the levitation here is giving rise to that whole demonic possession thing in my head as well. But, oh, you know, yeah. but the aliens can also levitate, as we've learned. If Dan Aykroyd has taught us nothing, it's that the aliens will levitate you. But, uh, <laughs> so the, the trio of, of tiny Johns. Uh, I'm sorry, Grays, uh, we're levitating her above the bed. So he dealt with the issue like any red-blooded American would. I grabbed my sword and I killed all three of them. Yes. <laughs> In fact, like ninja. over the course of his time living at Stardust Ranch, Edmonds claims to have dispatched 18 Grays in just such a fashion. Or as Oren Ishii would say, silly Caucasian man likes to play with samurai swords. <sighs> now the question is, did he keep any trophies? Wait. <laughs> oh, no. Good. I'm glad that this was answered. Michael, you and I operate on such a similar mental process <laughs> that I apparently am answering your questions before you ask them. <laughs> because here is my next paragraph. <laughs> You'd assume that rending that much intergalactic alien flesh would leave one with a significant mess to clean up. Not so, says Edmonds. Aww. You know, if you don't take the heads, they disappear, he indicates. <laughs> Unless you cut the head off and, uh, you know, disconnect the antenna there, uh, so to speak, they instantly phone home. <laughs> even with even with a razor sharp sword, it's nearly impossible to decapitate him with one swing. But the way that he's speaking, he's done it. Uh, oh yeah, he's, obviously. Uh, well, he's saying if you don't get their head, they're they just turn to they they're like you know Obi Wan Kenobi. The the robe just drops to the floor. <laughs> <laughs> There's just nothing left. So. You got to whip their uh, their head clean of their shoulders or else they're just going to evaporate. So they're zombie demons masquerading as aliens. Or Jedi Knights, I think. Or Jedi <laughs> Yeah. Was, I like that better. Did anyone ever go and, like, look through the house to see if there was any type of, like, bullet holes or, like, sword marks on the wall? Because I can't imagine killing 18 little greys is, like, not going to leave any other physical evidence. You, I'm more you thinking know. about the AK-47, because that, that shit's pretty loud. Well, uh, like, he's even a, if you're in the middle of nowhere, like, that... 
you know, now he's fired the AKs outside of the house, it seems. So it's like he's yeah. got, for ideal home defense, always opt for the samurai sword. Because, <laughs> you know, it's close proximity. You don't want to hurt your wife or anything with just errant shots. So let's just start swinging a sharpened sword around in the house. But uh, guns are for outdoors. Sharpened objects indoors. That seems to be his rationale. <sighs> In spite of this bizarre physical disincorporation that he claims, John also claims to have managed to finally collect a tissue sample from yes. one of his trespassers <laughs> in 2009. No. I don't know if he stopped and asked them for like a, a cup full of something or, or, you know, what happened. But he claims, after a particularly nasty squabble, that he was left with a large amount of tissue and fluid after he nearly split a gray in two parts with his exceptionally well-sharpened samurai sword. <sighs> he promptly sent off these remnants to renowned biophysicist Dr. William Levengood for spectrographic analysis. Levengood's findings were shocking. And here's where I'm going to interest you, Michael. Oh. According to a letter from Levengood to Edmonds, Levengood indicates that John has the smoking gun of proof of alien life here on Earth. The tissue was pure hemoglobin of a type not found on this planet, which okay. has only been discovered at sites where cattle have been mutilated. The liquid sample appears to be pure hemoglobin, and the skin looks like segmented grass, except it's not grass, but a plant crossed with an unearthly animal-based substance. To break this down further, the sample cells contain all the protein structures of animal physiology, but the interior nucleus of the cell, according to this report, contains mostly chlorophyll. You know, the thing that plants crave. <laughs> huh. Is so, the name of the uh, doctor a lie? It is not. <sighs> oh, I was going to ask if the whole doctor thing was a lie. But also not a lie. I had to think for a moment to see if uh, that name uh, was if it struck a chord with Ghostbusters or any of that. So, uh, <laughs> well, he's, he's good and gone, but he's not loving good. Ah, so. uh, okay. Uh, in any event, uh, <laughs> this is, to put it mildly, scientifically baffling as this has never been seen on our astral plane just yet. However, don't be too quick to call your mother and warner of the impending interstellar war just yet, because soon after these tests were conducted, Dr. Levengood died. In questionable circumstances, I will add. <laughs> well, of course, don't they always? In 2013, having fallen in his laboratory and passed away soon afterward. Boy, he had life alert. I've fallen and I can't get my samples. <laughs> no, save the samples. And I know this is going to be shocking to everyone here, but even more curiously, Edmonds claims that all of the samples sent to the doctor also disappeared from the lab at just this exact time. Of course hmm. they did. Curious. What, what I else smell, could happen? I smell government conspiracy, <laughs> don't you? Oh, let me call my mom. She'll she'll know. Well, your mom might have something to say about this next bit of uh, incident here. In 2011, the Edmonds elected to bring in the Doctor of Divinity, Brandy Howe. Howard Howe. Yes, uh, I'm not kidding. Doctor of Divinity Brandy Howe to attempt to rid the home of its intruders. She planned to use crystals to clear the home of invading entities. Duh. Oh, yeah. so she's from Sedona. <laughs> I have a really lovely shop here and I have a, a wide array of different sort of, you know, cubits and uh, zirconias and uh, I can get those aliens right out of your house for $457 a session. <laughs> It sounds about right. <laughs> I love this lady in ways that are not sanctioned by the government, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> Contrary to everything else that we've included in the buildup here, here comes Doctor of Divinity Brandy Howe. She claims to have encountered a heavy, dark energy permeating the property. 
as you'd expect. She purports to have witnessed three beings. She claims they looked like Klingons. <laughs> <laughs> so they're plant Klingon demon zombies that are masquerading as gray me- aliens. I just like that huh. we went from like three foot tall aliens <laughs> with like no physiology whatsoever to fucking Klingons. <laughs> like giant dome crested freaking skull creatures. Okay, perfectly fine. Well, at least we can talk to them now because we we know Klingon. We teach yeah, it in some yes. colleges and stuff. It yeah, says so. balls on your face so <laughs> so according to uh, brandy Howe, these klingons entered the home via a portal and then she later encountered the spirit of a young man who claimed to have committed suicide on the property and then further claims to have been struck by lightning while holding a sword in the air in the backyard is he highlander why the fuck she has a sword, I don't know. I thought she was using crystals, not dragon lance. So, oh, I thought the person that committed suicide was struck by lightning. No, with Doctor the sword. Divinity Brandy Howe was standing in the backyard and got struck by lightning. She killed the Klingon Highlander, and she got, she had the what was it called from the show, The Quickening, yes. where she got all the per, all the Klingons' memories. There can be only one. So they're plant. Demon Klingon uh, zombie Highlanders that are masquerading as gray, gray little John aliens. Okay. Yeah. I understand uh, everything now. You know, I, I've tried to make sense of this, but this is all kind of a big gray area for me, so I'm struggling. But... No, it's a tiny gray area because they're only three foot tall. <laughs> <laughs> if you stack them all together, you can have the Mothman, so it'll be uh, oh. just a. You know... That's how they can get on uh, roller coasters and everything. Or they airplanes. Have a giant overcoat. Yeah, an overcoat. Yeah. Yeah, they're just okay. molesting children worldwide. It's, and just, it's all you know, coming exposing together. Exposing themselves, just walking around oh. castles and you coasters. Wanna, <laughs> you want to buy some watches? <laughs> you must be this tall to ride this ride. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. <laughs> the Greys have big Space Jam energy to me for some reason. <laughs> oh no, I can't see them as anything other the, than the them. Monstars. Yeah, yep. yeah. <laughs> they were small, but good... now they're really big. It's uh-huh. you know. You know, Charles Barkley does live in this state, so maybe they stole his energy. <laughs> Why well, come y'all keep letting me in this house and you don't got food? <laughs> That's the Charles Gray. It's fine. He's just going to mutter nonsense over in the corner and say that the Suns are his team. Uh, (laughs) Anywho, shockingly enough, her presence did nothing to disrupt the activity in the home (laughs) in any way. Ah, strange credulity, I know. She provoked them. She's asking for more. Uh But not even... That's why she got struck. Thunderstruck. Uh, no, no, lightning struck. <laughs> uh, not even famed Doctor of Divinity Brandy Ho could do it. Oh. All right. So, Ooh. according to the Edmonds, this is when the visitation by the men in black began to occur. Oh, no. <laughs> 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 Michael, so we're Smith. doing terrible on lies right now. We're doing so I, bad. I I don't even know what's going on anymore. Where am I? Like I'm 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 genuinely serious about this. Uh, I, I I will uh, I'll admit I gift you a couple here in a minute. So just oh, wait for it. But uh, yeah. So uh, John and Joyce have both witnessed Tommy Lee Jones and Will Smith. Apparently, uh, no. Men dressed in black, as you'd expect, uh, employing unmarked cars while observing the ranch. When approached, they advised John not to go public with any of the information he's uncovered. That's a that's a little late there. Uh, uh. <laughs> I think this was actually prior to the Ghost Adventures. Uh, in, oh. in reality. 
<laughs> like, I there's will been also, episodes. Let me uh, also just say that I have to kind of impose a framework on telling this story because when he is, particularly the Ghost Adventures episode, he just rattles off this stuff with no context. So he just goes through and is like, oh, so you have some problems on the property? Yeah, I kill all these greys with my samurai sword. And uh, then I got my AK-47 with a, you know, double banana clip and I just open up on him. It's like he's just rattling this stuff off with no real provocation. So I kind of have to write this whole thing to give it a framework. Otherwise, it would have just been incomprehensible. So you've seen the episode? What if he... Yes. Oh. <laughs> <sighs> Go figure. What if what if he and what was the other guy from like episode forty three that I have a hatred for that I can't remember his name? Travis Bob Lazar. Oh, Bob Lazar, yes. What if them two were just put into a room? And just um, I think it's actually Jeremy Corbell is who you're angry Jer- thank at. Thank you, Jeremy yes. Corbell. Lazar was the decent guy that was yes, trying he's to the physicist solve everything you with love. the migraine. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah. Uh yeah, so um Man, Bell and, and him just like just going at it. It just occurred to me that's manifested. That must be something that only physicists encounter because Bob Lazar shuts down and can't remember most of his history when he has a migraine on the Rogan podcast. Michael shuts down and can't remember most of the English language when he has a migraine on this podcast huh. or just in general. I see the uh. correlative here. <laughs> It's. Uh, I had a conversation with people at work uh, at at the pizza shop the other day, uh, saying like, "Yeah, physicists are very weird people." Out of the out of uh, the couple of people I know that studied physics in college, I was probably the more well adjusted of them. That's that's saying something. <laughs> I hate to use this joke because it's awful, but in other news, water wet. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. Is, is that because a lot of their work is theoretical or can be, or is there another reason? If I had, if I was actually like told to think about this hard, uh, I would You're probably not. say just. You'd probably hurt yourself. Yeah. In fact, I can already feel my brain boiling. Um, <laughs> I would probably say just because, in general, a lot of people that study physics think about things differently than a lot of other people. Um, and that's not saying anything derogatory or anything right, of that right, thing. No. It's just it, it, the people that usually that usually choose a choosely. I combine two words. <laughs> I love that <laughs> gum. It's very this tasty. Going, yes. Uh, I'm going ghost. Um, <laughs> so I don't know why I decided to. Anyway. <laughs> I'm trying I'm to creep around, ghost. but my butt cheeks are slapping together <laughs> with such ferocity that they hear me coming. <laughs> but I'm dummy thick in the sound of my ass cheeks clapping is alerting the cards <laughs> but um for for people that stu- <laughs> for people that study physics like you have to have a different analytical attitude about things uh-huh. um and so a lot of people that are drawn to that field think through things differently i've i've been told by uh people in uh that study finance that a lot of companies will hire physicists uh, as advisors mm-hmm. or um, or consultants, because of the way that we approach problems um, differently, and so I would say that that has a big contributing factor to why physicists on the whole are different, uh, or at least slightly off kilter from normal people. Um, and I think that's probably why I don't really like Big Bang Theory that much because I feel like. I don't know. I'm about to get into a little rant, so I'm going to stop. Okay. Talking, I was going to say, yeah, he's he's gone on for five minutes just to avoid the word autism. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but that's that's why that's that's my opinion on it. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Uh, when you're trying to think theoretically, you do have to be outside of the box somewhat from time to time. And uh, when you go too far out of the box, you can't find your way back in. Well, speaking of boxes, uh, we've got some unmarked ones here that the men in black are climbing in and out of. So uh, Joyce, again, a purportedly uh, former FBI employee, indicates there are no discernible markings on the cars or identifying brands or logos, nor plates of any kind to be found on their automobiles. So they are wholly anonymous. (gasps) Except for the guy Fox mask. (laughs) did joyce really work for the fbi or is that just i have no idea they they claim she did Uh Uh, i it is not a lie i have contrived they may have done so on their own but uh yeah that is 
what they claim. So, it is on this particular point that we hear from the great and glorious interplanetary intervention aficionado himself, Dan Aykroyd, as a surprising advocate for the credibility of Edmund's claims. Oh, no. Now, before you call bullshit, Michael, let me elaborate a touch. (laughs) Aykroyd himself had a notable encounter with the MIB that he detailed in multiple interviews. For the uninitiated, in 2002, Aykroyd was working on a documentary for the Sci-Fi Channel with a number of recognized names in the world of ufology, including Linda Moulton Howe, uh, Stephen Greer, and John Mack. They had filmed eight episodes of the series, and they were close to airing. Now, this story is bizarre in and of itself. So, one day after filming, Aykroyd stepped outside for a cigarette and answered a phone call from (gasps) Britney Spears, who wanted to talk about an upcoming SNL episode that she was hosting that she wanted him to take part in. So, as Aykroyd tells it while he was on the phone talking to Britney Spears, somewhat starstruck, as you would expect, he turned and looked out onto 42nd Street in New York and noticed a black SUV with several men dressed in black gazing at him very intently. He also indicates there's one, like, giant guy that got out of the back of the car and particularly hard stared him. And he says that's the guy that really kind of gave him a weird feeling. So then... (laughs) I just picture these people are just sitting there, like, you know... Uh Because it's New York, it's probably, you know, bumper to bumper. They're just taking up space. Uh-huh. This guy literally gets out of the van. And mean mugs him. stands there and just, just <laughs> stares at him. No movement, no anything else. Yep. It's like, oh, yeah, we're being secret about this. Mm. Yep. The men in black, they're very covert. <laughs> they gather in large groups and just stare at everybody. <laughs> Meanwhile, there's some New Yorker or a taxi cab behind him saying, hey, move your car! <laughs> <laughs> oh! <laughs> I'm walking here. I'm walking the street, <laughs> asshole. <laughs> so, uh, Aykroyd turns away, engrossed in his call with Spears, and then does a double take once he realizes what he'd seen. Within the few seconds that it took for him to turn around, he claims the car had completely vanished. He does this w- with alarming explanation so he goes on for about two minutes like i know 42nd street i know it's traffic they couldn't have turned around they couldn't have made a u-turn they couldn't have been there There was a lot of people around there they couldn't have just disappeared i was looking for that car and it just disappeared like two seconds there's no way they would have found them so he claims that the vehicle was cloaked (sighs) two hours later Aykroyd and the cast of his show were told that his show had been canceled completely and would never see air To this day, he has never been given a reason or justification for why this is the case. So, given my history with these phenomena, Aykroyd states, I can't see why John and Joyce would lie about these incidents. I mean, all the people who I've (laughs) talked to about their experiences, they seem very genuine. I don't know anyone who's come forward publicly that I would doubt, personally. Uh, I mean, again, their lives were severely negatively affected by these experiences. I mean, I can't see how they would benefit from lying about them. (laughs) <laughs> anyway, buy my vodka. Uh-huh. <laughs> In Aykroyd's view, only those on the verge of inadvertently imbalancing the cosmic scales somewhat are drawing the ire or attention of the MIB. As such, this would, in his view, authenticate the claims from Stardust Ranch and give the impression that something catastrophic was occurring on the property. Although... As though to emphasize this point, incidents began to broaden in scope further as Stardust soon began to uh, have some rather strange events following the MIB encounters. (laughs) We already have plant-based demon (laughs) zombie Klingons Uh masquerading as little gray people from Space Jam, so... (laughs) They're already. I don't know how it could get any worse. It's already season three of The Walking Dead in the house. I mean, he's basically <laughs> got to cut through half of the people he encounters with a sword in order just to get to the bathroom to piss. So I don't see it can get worse, but here we go. Is Britney Spears really involved in the situation? Yes. He really <laughs> claims it was Britney Spears no. he was talking to on the phone. Yep. Um. So Edmonds claims that he next began to see portals or or Stargate-like openings appearing on and around the range. (laughs) 
<laughs> I'm just picturing like the giant star uh, gate, the stone like, actual door. It yes. just appears. Uh-huh. And it's like, Whoa! <laughs> yep. uh, I'm also thinking like the giant wormhole kind of effect that they show on the other side of like this weird uh, abyss, like water thing trickling out in his property. He's like, oh my god. <laughs> Joyce, it's the aliens again. They come through the they come through the portal. Hide the horses. Oh, Give God. me my sword. <laughs> Joyce, where's where's the samurai sword? Come on. <laughs> Daddy's gotta go to work. Come on. Give me the sword. <laughs> Gonna go fuck these little aliens up. Here we go. <laughs> Strike one, Butterfingers. I'm coming to cut your little nuts off. <laughs> All right. So Edmonds, uh, these portals are often large enough for triangular craft, wings, or orb-like ships to pass through. In John's estimation, an array of objects have also been seen leaving the space around the ranch, while other craft are claimed to be re-entering the property and their home dimensions via these gates as well. So now they're just a fucking spaceport. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was thinking, that they were like some intersection or something like that, where it's, oh yeah, you take the uh, the highway, the I-10 over this way, and you cut through the ranch, and then you make a left <laughs> To go on to the 17 to go up north to the uh, fifth dimension. No, it's just totally. Just watch out for the guy. He's got a sword. Just don't stay too long or else he'll start chasing you. It's totally become the diner from Spaceballs. Like, that. it's just Uh what it is. I was going to say is, like, this is apparently the most wretched hive of scum and villainy that you'll find in Arizona. It's just the, you know, the cantina scene happening constantly. (laughs) (laughs) All these things landing in his backyard. Chewbacca's walking out of the back of the house. All right, so following several such encounters, John elected to defy the instructions of the MIB and tell his story publicly. Joyce, however, perhaps out of her abundant knowledge of the inner workings of the government, avoids publicity at all costs. Uh, Even in the Ghost Adventures episode, one of the few times she's agreed to an interview, I will note, she took part only with her voice, uh, and it was disguised, and she did not show her face. She just showed a really bad moo-moo that she was sitting in. And her knees down, basically. So they did not show her face nor her actual voice on the show. Okay. At this point, however, John has indicated that, frankly, he's just had enough of dealing with all of these assaults and anomalies. Oh, we never signed up for this, John laments. <laughs> you know, it wasn't on the lease, so I, I don't know. I just I can't deal with it. If anymore. we'd known about the aliens, we never would have bought the ranch, Okay. This just kind of fell in our laps, you know. It's like a big pile of dog poop. Yeah, I I stepped in it, and now I just want to clean off my shoes and just keep walking, okay? That's all I want to do. One theory posited as a cause of these encounters is the ranch's proximity to the Palo Verde nuclear power plant. Oh, no. I was wondering when this would be Here we are. It is separated by only 40 miles, roughly. And so the belief is that the extraterrestrial craft, this was on the Ghost Adventures episode as well, uh, that the extraterrestrial craft need to leach energy from the nuclear reactors in order to refuel while they're earthbound. That makes a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh Yeah. That explains why my electricity bill is so high. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. Yeah. They're worried about building the wall. They should have put a freaking roof on Arizona. That that would have saved us from the aliens we really need to worry about. (sighs) All right. So, to add further drama to an already brimming pot, a pair of podcasters, Brian Frange and Phoebe Tires, or Tears maybe, I don't know, T-Y-E-R-S, I've not encountered them previously, have called Edmund's sanity into question. (laughs) <laughs> Here you are, Courtney, on their sci-fi-oriented, unbelievable podcast. The writer-comedians have floated the theory that Edmonds may actually be hiding something more insidious than alien activity at the Stardust Ranch. Frange, in particular, doesn't mince words. Is John Edmonds abusing his wife in her sleep and then blaming it on aliens? I'm not saying he's a sociopath, but he does display traits that could be classified <laughs> as sociopathic. Adds Frange, who admitted he's a bit of an armchair hobbyist in personality disorders and loves studying oh people who claim to have been abducted by aliens. Mm. 
It might not even be that he just cooked up a story about aliens in order to cover up the fact that he's beating his wife. There's a distinct possibility that he honestly believes aliens are abducting his wife and causing the bruises because subconsciously he needs to create a defense mechanism to allow him to view himself as a good person. <laughs> I don't think Please you... tell me that was bullshit. <laughs> not bullshit. Oh. I don't think that should be allowed to be put out in the world. <laughs> it's like diagnosing of someone that you're very uh -huh. separate from well courtney Ugh. don't feel bad because edmonds himself is very dismissive of frange's speculation oh, he's actually great. sort of just uh flippant about it whenever it's relayed back to him you know people have a tendency to always think the worst you know but that's a reflection of them not us <laughs> he says everybody has a right to their opinion it doesn't mean that it has any legitimacy Granted, legitimacy is the biggest word this man's utilized in the entire context of anything I've read, so I'm somewhat, you know, curious as to whether or not he actually said it, but who knows. <laughs> well, I'm inclined to trust him because he wants to rescue dogs and horses, which is all the right things to do, but he's, he's, something's going on here. He, so also, it's claimed that he's like, you know, I don't know whether they're actually saying this or what, but he's supposedly a retired musician, a uh, concert promoter, like all of these things that they're claiming, and now we're going to add something else into the boot here as well. Oh, good. Oh, no. <laughs> because in late 2017, a small local news item was published expressing the Edmonds' decision to sell the 10-acre property that they've lived on for the past 21 years for a headline-grabbing $5 million. What? <laughs> this is Buckeye, mind you. No, so that just... property is not. I don't think the whole town is worth five million dollars. Uh, you'd have to, you know, <laughs> pay me five million dollars to, you know, napalm it. I think, but <laughs> sorry, I can't. Uh, from the looks of the forty-year-old five-bedroom ranch home sitting on acres of untended desert, oh. there seems uh, little to justify the exorbitant <laughs> asking price. <laughs> well, the experience, you know. Uh huh. Yeah. For context, the Maricopa County Assessor places the cash value of the house at $356,000, and uh, Zillow estimates the value of the entire ranch in, you know, as uh, $873,000. I'll take it. Let's, <laughs> let's go find us some little John alien babies. So what's yeah. funny about this is the reason this was brought to my attention, and I will give credit where it is due here, but we, I'll decide whether or not we want to keep this. Melissa showed this to me because her mom was very excited about the Ghost Adventures episode because her home that she is now occupying with her new husband is on this property. What? Uh-huh. It is a part of the estate that was sold off. So she's kind of on the outskirts of the full extent of the property, and that is where they're living currently. So I'm not trying to give <laughs> their home address to everybody. They're not Michael. Uh, so we'll, you know, but this is how this came to my attention. So. <laughs> where uh, in proximity to the original bonfire? <laughs> that's a very their good question. house was built on it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Maybe they just, <laughs> oh, I'm going to stop. <laughs> Mary, Mary, when you listen to this, I'm sorry. But no, they, they just scraped together all the leave-ins there, and that was the furniture that was originally placed into the new home. It's uh, rustic. Hey, this couch isn't fully you know seared yet. Uh, there's still a couple pieces that are untarnished. Let's, uh, let's bring that on in. Anywho, uh, I'm just making the jokes here. Uh, <laughs> strangely enough, there was very little interest in the property. Overall, however, researcher and billionaire Robert Bigelow, who owns the Skinwalker Ranch in Utah, is purported <laughs> to have decided to investigate the claims of the paranormal and perhaps purchase the property. Which offers, to my mind, a substantive answer to a Aykroyd's question about why the couple would feel compelled to lie about their experiences. Wink. Wink. <laughs> John, who was frustratingly short on evidence despite claiming he's worked on and off as a professional photographer for 40 years. Oh, so, jack okay. of all trades, master of none, apparently. He's got <laughs> so many jobs. Hey, I mean, he's probably, you know, a five for one special. He'll, he'll, uh, you'll get the venue, he'll take the pictures, he'll hype it up, uh -huh. and you'll probably even play music. Who knows? It's a pretty sweet deal. Yeah. I'll take it. <laughs> Sold. Sold American. Uh, he has, shockingly enough, in spite of his experience, never managed to collect photographic evidence of activity on the property until placing it on the market following the airing of the Ghost Adventures episode. 
He has subsequently collected photographic and video evidence of various light anomalies claiming to have captured proof of the purported portals to another dimension. Ooh. He just he just took a he just took a clip from Stargate. <laughs> what would you look at that? <laughs> he just puts his own voice over. Oh look, it's Sir, funny again. <laughs> what is uh, what is James Spader doing on your property? Oh, he's uh, you know he comes visits with his machete. Yeah, he, uh, he likes to dispatch the monsters. I met him back in '96. He's a good guy. Good guy, that James Spader. Real good guy. Should have him over for dinner. He's very fun to you know have a conversation with. He knows that Robert Danny Jr., don't you know? They did some movies together. Good guy. Real good guy. Anywho. Uh, furthermore, John has recently gone on to claim that he's been branded by the aliens. Oh. And they said he got away branded. <laughs> he... I have to ask how. He uh, he recently shared a photo of a particularly nasty mark on his calf, which he not that's his bodily calf, not a small cow. <laughs> yeah. Important to distinguish considering <laughs> the uh, the property here. But uh, he says it came from a battle with a malevolent ET. <laughs> So they're E.T. Klingons that are part plants. And gray, and, yeah. And demons. They do phone home if yeah. you don't take their heads. So, I mean, this all makes That's sense. That's true. I wonder if he he's uh, that. luring them into the open with Reese's Pieces and then just <laughs> stabbing them with the sword. That's that's actually how he uh, lures them into traps. He just uh, Reese's Pieces trail right into like a box with a stick on top of it. No, no, he no. He chops the stick in half. Yeah, and... uh, yeah, he's got a hack-a-shack the aliens to death. <laughs> so he's on we, his we... bike with his machete, you know, around the property. <laughs> that's actually how they go in through the portals. They just come out as bikes. <laughs> he's chasing after them with swords. <laughs> a bunch of random men in black running around with... Uh, you know, handheld radios behind them going, <laughs> stop them. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Okay. So as he tells it, one evening without warning, an excruciating pain and a sense of crushing pressure befell his leg, followed by a disturbing indentation. Subsequently, both John and Joyce have again experienced skin punctures, triangular depressions in their skin, bruising, and skin disfigurements similar to what one would experience if exposed to radiation. All have been accompanied by nausea, gastrointestinal distress, and chronic fatigue, as well as muscle weakness. John has continued to operate the ranch as a rescue business... <laughs> in spite of the peril to all the animals he's claiming to save. Uh, but he has been continually harassed by thrill-seekers ever since the Ghost Adventures show aired. Well. <laughs> uh, he has also subsequently published a book with author Bruce McDonald chronicling the various phenomena encountered on the property entitled Stardust Ranch, The Incredible True Story which he published in 2019, and that is discoverable through the Amazon link that I have provided in the show notes here, so you can oh, go no. check this out for yourselves. But in conclusion, Mr. Edmonds would like to offer a, a word of warning to all of you would-be warriors that want to trespass the property. You should be wary. You know, it's not something for the traditional family. He says, but you know, it holds a lot of secrets and what I believe are future opportunities to understand forces that are in the universe. You know, just please be very well grounded because the energy here has the tendency to manifest whatever's going on with you. So is he saying he's responsible for these demons manifesting as E.T. Klingon plant-based demons uh no no he's saying this is just something about there are portals to other dimensions on this property that are just you know bringing stuff from from all over the known and unknown universe including okay. the 10th dimension uh right down into our little you know thatch desert over here and this went on for okay. 21 years yep and is uh you know for all intents and purposes, probably still going on today because I don't think any billionaires have swooped in to <laughs> snatch up this, you know, glorious grab here for five million. But uh, as for Stardust Ranch and John's story, it, for now, remains a mystery. And that, my dear friends, 
is the sordid story of Stardust Ranch. Oh my god. Yep. We got, we got one lie. Yep. <laughs> I do. Oh. Before you tell us the lies, though, so you can say whatever you want here, what do mm-hmm. you think is actually going on? Um, this all sounds really spurious to me. Uh, I, I, I hate to tell you. Um, from if you watch the Ghost Adventures episode in particular, this sounds like a guy who watched a bunch of movies and just wanted to sensationalize something happening in his little podunk nest out in the middle of Arizona desert and try to make it seem more appealing. It was like, listen, Joyce, uh, I, I've been, you know, fraudulent with my taxes now for the past 15 years, and we got to offload this property, and there's no way we're going to pay back all of the fines unless we sell this thing with a big bang. So how do you think we do it? Well, you know, I uh, I worked for the FBI, and uh, there's a lot of folks that uh, they love those UFO stores. Oh, yeah, I bet I could do that. I could do that real good. I could use my samurai sword that I keep in a bedroom there that we use in our foreplay sometimes. <laughs> oh yeah, we could do this. So I don't know. He has, he does have. There are photographs that they've shown of like desiccated ho- horse corpses. But I mean, you don't know whether they're taking it organically as it happened, or whether just they had a horse die on the property and they're right. like, oh, let's just leave that moldering out in the south field, and then I'll go take some oh. photos of it later on. Like, I, I don't want to be that. Uh, you know, I don't want to spin the conspiracy theory. But yeah, yeah. I, I don't really. I can't imagine this is really happening here, but who knows? Stranger things have occurred. Uh, but I'm I'm kind of wonky on the Travis Walton story myself as well. So yeah. anyway, all so, right, what did we miss? <laughs> uh, without the sword in hand, any further stabs or anything that uh, you you have uh, questions on before I dive into this nonsense? Since I didn't say it. Um, is it bullshit that the, uh, Dr. Divinity got struck by lightning while holding a sword? Nope. God, <laughs> I wish anything, it was. Anything about the doctor. Nothing about the doctor suspect. was a lie. That Ugh. is all her exact claims. And Jeez. there's stuff I could have included in here. Like, there's just no end to the number of things that they've included that are just random nonsense. And again, uh... I, I will tell you now, part of the lies is trying to impose order and any feeling of causality to these events. Ah. So some things I've included here as one led to the other, that didn't really happen. They just sort of well, vomit up random factoids and you expect you to just assimilate all of it in one fell swoop. So it's not like they're going, and then this happened, and then this happened. He's just like, oh, yeah, yeah, I kill him with the swords, and I shoot him with the guns. And then they cut to a lady and like, oh, yes, I was standing in the yard, and there's Klingons in the house, and I held the sword up, and I got struck by lightning. And then they cut to another guy. He's like, yeah, it's because of all of the uh, Palo Verde plant here. It's just, you know, there's a lot of UFO activities around nuclear plants. And you're like... I can't find a ballast for this at all. I don't know what's happening right now. I haven't done any drugs. So, all right. Of the eight lies, lie number one. Where are you? It's a long document. I apologize. So, uh, lie number one, and I'm glad that you all appreciated it, was that the uh, materials were placed into a bonfire on the edge of the property and just set ablaze. Um. It's even worse. The, he claims that he came home and the property, all of the stuff was just in the empty swimming pool. They just Whoa, threw everything in the pool. No. <laughs> I was like, you probably should have fired your real estate agent at that point if he just tossed everything in the pool. He's like, oh, there you go, fuck face. <laughs> so all of the. It's out of the house. <laughs> yep. So all of his stuff of him monitoring the inferno and the danger to the surrounding area and all of that, that was all Smart. the first That's a lie. a good lie. That was. Uh, so then uh, lie number two, Michael Cott was uh, the shirtless, uh, tattered khaki man in flip-flops <laughs> with the sunglasses, <laughs> an unruly thatch of hair, and a caterpillar mustache. Uh, it was just a, a crazed guy uh, who, who ambled up with a machete. That's all they said. They didn't give him any further details. So I was like, oh, I can have fun here. Uh, but he did say he's the one who kills the monsters on the property, and they were going to wish that he was still around. Yep. Uh, line number three is that unsettled and thoroughly confused, they routinely telephoned the authorities to report these sightings. That never happened. They never tried to corroborate anything. They didn't call anybody. They just went, oh, there's weird lights. Let's go look at it. All right. <sighs> In a very Arizona sort of like, oh, I'll take care of it. 
Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, lie number four is that uh, his distress over claiming that the Department of Agriculture opened an investigation into them for abusing their animals. That never happened because he never contacted the Department of Agriculture. He never had anybody come out to the property to investigate. He just has these claims that these things are happening. So uh, they were never mm-hmm. investigated for abusing their animals. In hindsight, that makes a lot of sense that none of that stuff would have taken place yeah. because it just mm-hmm. kept happening with no intervention. <laughs> yep. You'd yeah. assume somebody would have stuck around when they're like, oh, desiccated <laughs> horse corpse here. Yeah, no eyes, no tongue. Yeah, we should probably hang out here. Right. I don't imagine yeah. coyotes are doing this, so here we are. But um, line number five is that uh, the beginning to experience Joyce being levitated out of the room and down the hallways after their dogs died is not true. They just claimed that all of this stuff was just happening all at once. So uh, the way I phrased this was trying to make it seem like the dogs were somehow protecting the house up until that Uh, point. That was not the case. He was killing things with swords and shooting stuff with guns long before this happened. And then he's just like, oh, and our dogs died. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Oh, my God. I'm like, how are you running around the house wielding a sword when you've got three giant Rottweilers? Like, I don't think they're going to stand still while you're doing this. <laughs> so somebody's getting hurt. So I, it's possible he injured his dogs while in one of these freaking, you know, crazes. Rages. Uh, so that's lie number five. Lie number six. I'll have you note all of the stuff about the hemoglobin and the cell structure of the stuff that he claims to send. All that's true. Every no. single lick of it, he said all of that actually happened. Uh, line number six is the one that I thought for sure, even particularly because Michael said, well, you're going to try to swindle some Ghostbuster stuff on us. Dan Aykroyd <laughs> has never t- said anything about this. Uh, uh, he has no feelings about this whatsoever. I don't think he's ever mentioned them, and he's not brought in. He has had the interaction with the MIB, and that is where I drew the correlation here to have him have a segue to have uh, something to say about this. But yeah, all the stuff about uh, Dan Aykroyd caring about them at all, and they wouldn't lie about it. He has said that about many other people. The exact quote from him on the Rogan podcast was, all the people I've talked to about their experiences with you know alien abduction seem very genuine. All of them. I don't know why anybody would, would come forward that I would doubt, you know. Their lives have all been, you know, severely affected negatively by these experiences. So everything else I threw in there is all me. But uh, up to that point, yeah, he believes everybody. Okay. And so subsequently, uh, line number seven is that uh, after the MIB encounters occurred, things then ramped up again. And that's when they started seeing the Stargate shaped uh, portals and things like that. That just was also just happening. There was a group that came out to document activity on the uh, property and they claimed that they started seeing these little Stargate things, too. And they even found a rock. That was in the shape of one of these portals. And they used that as proof. It's like, this is exactly how John describes these portals as looking. He's like, oh, yeah, look at that. That's just how they look. It must be that's one of their you know, charging crystals they left behind, you know. So these people are just guano balls crazy. Wow. Uh, and lie number eight, finally, in the midst of all of this stuff, holy moly, is that... Um, he had never photographed or, or any caught any photographic evidence until the Ghost Adventures episode had aired. Um, he did not sell the property nor mark the valuation to five million until the Ghost Adventures episode oh. aired. But he had claimed to photograph things to help give him justification to sell the property. So those are the eight lies. But beyond that, everything else he claims is legitimate and actually occurring out there in Buckeye. Jeez. He did a great job of putting that all together because half well, that stuff, I was like, if this is happening, then it's all happening. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> yeah, he it's uh, if you want a really interesting, you know, like 30 minutes, um, you can just watch the first half of the Ghost Adventures because them documenting stuff happening is just, you know, its own brand of nonsense and, and crazy. But yeah, just watch the interviews with him and his wife. Because, yeah, he's... Zach Bagans is one of the, the great interviewers because he's so serious. He's very dour. Uh-huh. I just want to ask you, Joyce, um, have you ever invoked the name of Christ 
to try to repel these things. And she's like, oh, yeah, yeah, sometimes I have. He's like, oh, so you think you might be experiencing demonic activity here? And she's like, well, maybe. He's like, well, you know, demons do like to impersonate things. He's like, oh, man, oh, would you no. stop feeding the That's troll? All leading questions uh-huh. and everything yep. Jeez. yeah it's it's pretty difficult to stomach but uh yeah he's when you get to see his interviews he's a special brand of of nuts mr john edmonds i i love him dearly but uh that is what we've got here ladies and germaphobes so thank you for enduring this and i hope it was entertaining because i i certainly had a blast i the second melissa told me about this i was like you're killing you're like he's killing things with samurai swords and he claims this is happening like yeah I got to do this as an episode. Amazing. It makes perfect sense. This is probably my favorite haunted episode. Oh, um, yeah. Out of all of the ones that you've done. And they're all great. Mm-hmm. But just this one was just like, it was almost like a summation <laughs> of so many of the other ones that you've done. That's kind of what uh, I was referring to with the opening paragraph. I was like, it seems like he just stole the plot from about 14 different movies and just decided <laughs> to claim that it happened around his house. I, I what, did, what did we end on then? They were plant based et looking klingons uh that well now see they're they're all different entities because you've got the brillo men you've got the three feet tall grays you've got the uh, klingons you got the ghost boy who committed suicide on the property true presumably in the pool uh which has no water in it he just threw himself on top of the furniture (laughs) uh uh, so yeah, there's just any random number of phenomena happening here and all, and you know, then the MIB, of course, who are just, you know, keeping a, a watchful eye on everything, but not stopping the cattle from being mutilated or anything Ugh. helpful. They're just staring at people oh, and no. mad dogging them from the road. <laughs> so, <sighs> well, I believe that is going to wrap it up for episode 96. Woo. Friends, so we've reached the one year anniversary of After Dark because the their first episode we aired for After Dark on YouTube was June sixth of last year. Wow. So we've gone all the way around with uh, today's. Uh, well, as you're listening to this, this was last Wednesday's uh, After Dark, but we had Scott on from Book Invasion, which was a lot of fun, very entertaining talk there. Mm-hmm. So go check that out if you haven't already. And of course, we have just got wonderful content winging your way every week, whether it be here for new episodes on Monday. So if you have not already, please subscribe and, and give us a, a tasty little review wherever you get your please. preferred podcasts from. Uh, you know, be that iTunes or Google Play or Spotify. Go, go chat us up there if you love what we're doing because we would love to hear from you and it helps us out immensely and uh of course we have the glorious instagram which courtney is just pumping full of flaming hot content which you absolutely have to see every week i assure you it cannot be missed and i'm really looking forward to what we're going to get for this week (laughs) the samurai sword just covered in goop and uh, you know (laughs) random plant nonsense Nonsense is my word of the day, I've decided. I think we've probably got that 800 times now that I'm thinking about it. But uh, what are you going to do? <laughs> Curiouser and curiouser. But uh, anything else you uh, you beautiful folks want to throw in before we say goodbye to our friends here? No, that was great. Uh, yeah, no, it was a just chef's kiss. Well, thank you, children. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you all for being here. John, as you listen to this, uh, don't come back. But, uh, I kid. Good night, sweet prince. <laughs> Wait, prince has been dead for much longer than this. Oh. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, John, we love you. We miss you. Uh, and I'm sorry that you, you didn't get to take part in this one, buddy, because I'm sure you would have just uh, had a, a laugh That's riot. A yes, time. yes. But uh, And he would have called me onto the carpet for, for stealing some some last pod character voices here to utilize but uh so it's a good chicago in so all right i believe that is going to lay lead us to uh giving you a fond farewell to bidding you adieu so for the disinformed podcast this week i'm shane i'm michael i'm courtney and so long And please be sure that you've locked your doors, windows, and kept your dogs kenneled because the aliens, they're coming for you. Hide your kids. Hide your wife. 
they're getting they're getting gray up. In.